Okay. All right, we're up, uh, we're up live now. Welcome to Rosemont and those that are listening uh, on the live stream, welcome tonight. We're starting a new study tonight, new study. We just finished our prayer time and uh, uh, over the next few weeks, we're gonna be looking at the Gospels. Now, last, uh, uh, for the last few months, we've been looking at the Old Testament and uh, we finished up with Malachi uh, last week. But then when the New Testament comes out, uh, that's after the death of Jesus, death, resurrection, and ascension back into heaven, uh, the New Testament begins to be written. And there's been about a little over 400, 450 years since the last book of the Old Testament and the first book of the New Testament is written. We're gonna be looking specifically at the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, those four books. And, and, and we're going to look at a couple of things, questions over the next few weeks. Uh, we're going to be answering what is the Gospel? Why are they called the Gospels? Gospels, as we know, means good news. But why do we call it the Gospels? Uh, shortly after they were written, uh, they've been, they are started to be referred to as Gospels. And the Gospels according to Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and the Gospel according to John. Uh, an interesting note on that, you look in all four of the Gospels, and there's not a verse anywhere that tells you who wrote them. And it's uh, those names were attributed, uh, Matthew the tax collector, Mark, or John Mark, which was, uh, uh, it was a companion of Peter, and they figure it's actually the Gospel according to Peter as written down by John Mark. Uh, then we look at the, the Gospel according to Luke. Luke was not an eyewitness. He was a physician, but he got his information from eyewitnesses. And then we've got the, uh, the Gospel according to John. And we know that John wrote not only John, but he wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John at the end of our New Testament. And, and very important, he also wrote the book of Revelation. And we can see John's writing style throughout all of these things. But he is not mentioned by name. So they're, uh, they're anonymously written, but the early church fathers had attributed uh, these people to the Gospels. And why? Why four Gospels? Why wouldn't one Gospel be enough? Well, we're going to answer those questions, and this is where we're going. Um, and then you all uh, you hear about all the time about the synoptic gospels. Well, what are the synoptic gospels? Well, very quickly, that's Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and that's because. And let me give you a couple of statistics with them. It, it's uh, those books share a lot of common passages out of the. 661 verses in Mark, 500 of those verses show up in Matthew in parallel form. Some of it word for word, some of it very, very close. And when I talk about word for word, I'm talking word for word even in the Greek. And then 350 of those 631 verses occur in Luke. And we got uh, when we look at Mark, very little of Mark is unique to Mark. 90% of it is repeated over in between Matthew and Luke. And then when we look at Luke and Matthew together, uh, they share another 235 verses that are unique to Matthew and Luke. And then they both each have some unique verses and things of themselves. Um, but like I mentioned, very little in Mark is, is unique to Mark. And then, uh, uh, and then it only takes a casual reading of the Gospels to know that John is just plain different than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And there are very little in John uh, that's, uh, uh, that's shared by Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, for instance, Jesus' baptism, the calling of the twelve, exorcisms, the transfiguration, the various parables, and even the institution of the Lord's Supper is not in John. It seems like John that was written, and I'll be getting next week into the dates that these were written, but obviously John was written much later, and he chose to put in those things 
that were not already. He probably had access to the earlier Gospels. And he says, I want to put in things that they did not cover. But uh, it, it's, uh, John has a number of things. There are lengthy discourses, talkings or sermons by Jesus that is not repeated in, in the other Gospels. You know, his, uh, his Gospels or his talks about being the bread of life. Or what's very significant is in, uh, is in John 13 through 16, a very lengthy discourse that he gives his disciples the final instructions the night before he dies, before he goes to the, goes to the cross, uh, from John 13 through the end of 16. And that is recorded nowhere else. Uh, we find a couple of things in John that is not in the others. The miracle of water turned to wine. The, uh, the fact that Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, you only find that in John. His early ministry in Judea and Galilee, his regular visits to Jerusalem, and the other Gospels, they only record one visit to Jerusalem. And John, he's been there at least three times. At least three times. And, and uh, we're talking about during his ministry. Uh, it, it's a uh, different theme and, and, and that he has. And John's narrative style is, is, a, is quite a bit different. Sometimes it's hard to determine with John where Jesus is speaking or he is given narration. Now, if you remember a little over a year ago, uh, I gave a talk about uh, uh, how our Bible came together and the different... Uh, uh, things that are in the Bible and, and things that are different. And, and one thing I talked about is your red letter Bibles. You know, the words of Jesus are all in red letters. Well, for instance, that is somebody's interpretation of what Jesus was speaking. And especially in John, that's very difficult. Uh, and, and I say this because, for instance, in John 3, there's a lot of talk in there that's attributed to Jesus but there's a lot of scholars who believe Jesus spent, is finished talking at around verse 14 or 15 in its narration, John 3, 16, is not necessarily words of Jesus. But we don't know that. And, and, and the thing is, it's where does Jesus stop speaking and where does narration talk? So uh, start, and, and that's hard to determine with, uh, with John and his writing styles. But when we look at the different gospels here, when we look at the different gospels, uh, in Matthew, Christ is presented as the son of David, the king of the Jews and everything in his narrative and the way the various, even the shared passages are, deals and centers around these truths. Jesus, Jesus as the son of David, Jesus as the king of the Jews. In Mark, Christ is depicted as the servant of Yahweh, the servant of the Lord, as the one who, though equal with God, made himself of no reputation and took upon himself the form of a servant. So it is the suffering servant that we see emphasized in Mark. In Luke, Christ is set up as the Son of Man, as connected uh, but contrasted from the Son of Man. Notice, even in the genealogy in Matthew, where the genealogy goes back to where? You know, Abraham is talking about, you know, the, uh, the kingly, especially from David. Uh, you know, he's the Son of David in the uh, genealogy from there. But where does the genealogy in Luke go? It goes all the way back to Adam, emphasizing the humanity of Jesus. And we see that in Luke. Uh, a little thing about Luke. If anybody ever see the Jesus film? That's been out all around the world. It's been translated in uh, two, three hundred different languages. It's interesting. It, you ought to watch it if you saw I mean, You can actually, you can Google it and find it online. But the Jesus film is actually uh, the life of Jesus according to Luke. And you might see some things, and a lot of us are familiar with uh, Matthew, but it follows very closely, very closely to the book of Luke. And then in John, Christ is revealed as the Son of God. 
And everything in this fourth gospel is made to illustrate and, and to emphasize Jesus' divine relationship. It is, you know, and where does, where does John start? It's interesting where Matthew and, and Luke, they, they cover the birth sequences. Uh, and, and over in um, and, and Mark, where does uh, Mark start? He starts off with his earthly ministry. But where does John start? In the beginning, in the beginning was the Word. And so it emphasizes Jesus as being with God and Jesus being God. And so, you know, the Word was with God and the Word was God, was God. We see all of that emphasized in John. Now, as we look at uh, uh, these these accuracies or the uh, things, uh, if you remember about a year and a half ago, uh, when I finished up the last uh, uh, Science in the Bible, I finished up with a, uh, a night talking about the accuracies of our text, the, the text, our New Testament text. More specifically, I talked about the Gospels and how accurate that they are. And right now, we, we, we got to realize that 97 to 99% of the text that we have in our, in our Gospels is undisputed. It is accurately, it, it is accurately portrays what was in the original autographs. When you hear that word autograph, especially talking about Bible books, autographs means the original. Obviously, we do not have any originals, but they figure it's accurate to within 97 to 99 percent. Uh, so it's beyond any reasonable doubt. <clears throat> and the thing is, the Christian faith doesn't hang on any of the disputed texts. Now, a couple of texts that is disputed, uh, and I need to bring this up, is the very ending of Mark. Uh, most scholars agree Mark ends at chapter 16, verse 8. Somewhere along the line, someone added verses 9 through 20. And, and, and if you look at 9 through 20, uh, the, the, the oldest and most reliable, complete copies of the gospel do not have verses 9 through 20. It was added in. And there are some that says that it, uh, uh, it is potentially heretical, meaning it's, uh, there's some, uh, possibly some heretic in that. And certainly it could be fatal, especially if you look at verse 18. You know what verse 18 Mark 16 verse 18 deals with? That's your snake handling. Yeah, that's your snake handlers come from that. People who build whole theologies off of a single verse need to be examined, but especially verses that are in question. And then, in law, and John, you know there's a sizable passage in John that's very much in question. You know what passage that is? That's the passage uh, uh, starting in John 7, verse 53, through John 8, verse 11. And that deals with the woman caught in the very act of adultery. And remember, Jesus says, you know, he was without sin cast the first stone. It's interesting when they examine that, the oldest manuscripts do not have those verses. But uh, there's no reason to believe from most scholars that this was probably something that really took place that someone inserted uh, in that early first or second century after John was written. But uh, they feel that it is accurate, and they feel that it is inspired, uh, but it was not part of the original autograph. It was added in at some point later. But I do want to bring that out, uh, where, uh, where the end of Mark is very much questioned. Uh, the one in John, it is questioned, but they believe it was authentic. It was, uh, uh, it was something that had really taken place. It's interesting, uh, why do we have the four Gospels? Why we have the four Gospels? Uh, especially in the early centuries, uh, and especially in the second century, there was a Gospel of Thomas that came out. I forgot to bring my book over tonight, but I got a copy of the book of Thomas. It's in a, a, a group of other books, you know, the lost books of the Bible. 
Well, the lost books of the Bible were never lost. They were intentionally uh, not included. And the Gospel of Thomas is known as one of the uh, Gnostic Gospel. There's a lot of heresy in there, uh, Gnostic heresies. Uh, Thomas most certainly did not write it because he was long dead. It was written in the mid uh, uh, second century, you know, around 150 or somewhere around there. But it is definitely not one of the Gospels. But it's interesting when we look at the Gospels and we look at the life of Jesus, and I want to quote from a well-known uh, Christian skeptic, a guy by the name of Bart uh, Herman. He says, as we will see, the oldest and best sources we have for knowing about the life of Jesus are the four Gospels of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. This is not simply the view of Christian historians who have a high opinion of the New Testament in, his, in its historical worth. It is the view of all serious historians of antiquity of every kind from the committed evangelical Christian to the hardcore atheist. They'll, they, they at least concede you want to know about the life of Jesus, you need to look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, I do want to mention, you know, as, as, we, as we move into the New Testament, and the thing I want to finish up with tonight, and, and just to remind us, especially since we finished and, and we closed the Old Testament last week, is we have to realize that at the time period that these were written, and I'll talk about more about that next week, uh, uh, there are those who think that it was written as early as 50 A.D., and if you think about that, 50 A.D., that was uh, 15 to 20 years after the death of Christ, so it was fairly quickly, uh, possibly as late as Matthew, Mark, and Luke, possibly as late as 70 A.D. They don't think it was done after 70 A.D. because what happened in 70 A.D.? What happened in 70 A.D.? Anybody remember? Now, this is a monumental event to the Jews. 70 A.D., Jerusalem and the temple was utterly, utterly destroyed by the Romans. That is a monumental event uh, infamous, if you will, but a monumental event in the life of the Jews, uh, if you look at their history. And none of those, uh, none of these relate to that. They feel like it had to occur before, with the exception of John. John may have been written as late as 90 AD. Uh, but even in John's writing, uh, including Revelation, there's no reference to the destruction of Jerusalem. And so some people think that may have been occurred. But I'll talk about that more uh, next week. But it's important to understand the time frame that they were written in because it was fairly recent history. It was things that were fairly fresh in people's mind. And I'll talk about more next week about what was written first. But we need to understand there was a big change, a mindset change when we left uh, Malachi 400 years, 400, 450 years earlier to the Jews of Jesus' day. And I want to talk about that. There were 400 years of silence. The last prophet that we had recorded is Malachi. Malachi. Now, there were some other books written during that time, and we, we uh, but uh, there are very, very few that recognize any of those things as being inspired or being canonized as being part of the scripture. But during this time, a lot of things happen. Uh, and, and, and I preached on this a couple of times before, and actually I preached them around Christmas time because we talk about when Christ came. And, and a passage that I like to use at Christmas is Galatians 4.4, 4, and it talks about when the time was right, Jesus came. There was a right time in history. It was a right time culturally. Uh, during this time, around 330 uh, BC, this is some possible about 100 years after Malachi lived, uh, a big event happened. 
and that was called Alexander the Great. And he came through and he took over the known world at the time. He Hellenized, the word is Hellenized. He, he brought the Greek culture to the known world. And he brought the Greek language to the known world. And their literature, their architecture, their thought. Greek became a unifying language in our New Testament. Our Gospels were written in Greek. It was the international language of the day. In 280 BC, 280 BC was the start of what was the Septuagint. And do you remember what the Septuagint is? I bring that up all the time. It's the Greek Old Testament. It's the Greek <coughs> translation of the Old Testament. And we have to realize when the Old Testament is quoted in the New Testament, it's the Septuagint that is quoted. That's why when you read an Old Testament passage in the New Testament and you look it up in the Old Testament, it doesn't read quite right because we're translating from a, from a Greek text and not from the original Hebrew. So it doesn't read, read quite the same. But it, the, the Greek Old Testament was what was found around the known world at that time. Uh, uh, the Greek culture broke down a lot of nationalism, including uh, the Jewish culture. Uh, it was also a right time politically. A lot of things transpired. Uh, you realize Israel was not a nation. Uh, clear from uh, 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 its own entity uh, since before the fall of Jerusalem, in, uh, in 580 BC, you know, when Nebuchadnezzar came in and he destroyed everything and hauled the people off into captivity. Uh, they were, they, they, they had about 100 years of independence uh, up until about 60 AD, and that's when Pompey came through and Romanized everything and conquered Israel. And he uh, defiled the, uh, he tore down the temple, the second temple, before Herod rebuilt it. And he defiled the holies, holies, and they Romanized everything. But with Roman, with the Roman coming in, uh, you had uh, what was called Pax Roma. Uh, you had Roman peace. Rome kept the peace. If there was an uprising, they didn't just put it under their thumb, they stomped on it. And they ruled with an iron fist, but they kept the peace. Uh, you remember the thing about all roads lead to Rome. They had a transportation system like the, uh, uh, the world had not seen at that point. And that enabled the gospel to spread over the whole known world. Jesus came at just the right time to enable the gospel to be spread. And it was able to spread like no other time in history. It was the right time spiritually. The Jews, ever since their exile, only worshipped Yahweh God. They were no longer seeking after other gods, the Canaanite gods and Baal worship and so forth. Uh, they never had a problem. But, but the problem with the Jews, they kind of went the other way where they went from worshiping anything that moved, they went to, uh, uh, they took the Ten Commandments and they built a whole fence around it with over 600 commands of do's and don'ts. And, and you know, remember a lot of the things that Jesus talked about. Uh, Jesus, as we get recorded in the Gospel, he came and said, you know, I didn't come to destroy the law, but to, what, fulfill the law. But he also talked about the law. And, and he talked about how much uh, they, they, they missed the whole intent of the law. Uh, the fact that uh, uh, Rome occupied Israel, they were ready for a Messiah to come. Now granted, they were looking for a political leader uh, versus uh, a spiritual leader, but they were ready. And uh, uh, a couple other notes here. Uh, uh, the Jews, um, uh, a, a couple summaries here. They prove the, their ability to maintain their identity in difficult circumstances. Their struggle with idolatry was over. Torah, remember what the Torah was, first five books of the Old Testament, became central in Jewish life. The oral tradition uh, 
was uh, very much in place. You know, they had 39 different laws just to keep the Sabbath. And remember, uh, Jesus was always uh, running up. He was healing on the Sabbath. And you remember all of those stories and what he had to say about those rules. Different doctrines emerge that we see in the New Testament that we don't see in the Old Testament. Uh, doctrines about angels, doctrines about demons, doctrines about the resurrection. And that they were all open for those things. Uh, the development of the synagogue. Synagogue came about during the exile. The synagogue is what our church is patterned after. And we're talking about local worship. Uh, things that we read about in the New Testament, the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, developed during this intertestamental period. And, um, and they found a lot, uh, they, they were ready for the Messiah to come, but we also found that the Gentile world was ready for Jesus to come. Uh, some I mentioned last week, uh, 560 to 480, we had Buddha in India. 550 to 470, we had Confucius in China. Uh, 420 to 322, we had Plato and uh, Aristotle in Greece. You know, we had these other world of religions emerging, which by the way, anybody know when Islam rose? It wasn't until about 600 A.D., 600 years after Christ, that Islam became at something about 600, 650, somewhere around in there. Islam didn't become a religion, and Muhammad didn't live until 600 years after Christ. But Jesus came at just the right time. And when these Gospels were written, you know, especially the book of Matthew became a primer. That was what everybody used. Uh, to learn about Christ and we had all the letters of Paul which by the way you know what the first book of the New Testament was was written according to most scholars that's the book of Galatians the book of Galatians it's interesting uh, Paul's letter to the Corinthians the Corinthians was written before the Gospels uh, and what's interesting about that is we have in uh, 1 Corinthians 11 uh, the recording of the Lord's Supper. And that's usually what we quote from when we have the Lord's Supper. But that was written before the Gospels were written. So it's just just an interest, uh, just a note of interest. But uh, the thing is, Christ came at the right time. Romans 5, 6, Paul writes, he says, For when we were still without strength, in due time, when the time was right, Christ died for the ungodly. But also that we have to remember is he came at the right time the first time. He's also going to come at the right time the second time. Uh, Revelation 22, verse 12, he says, Behold, I am coming quickly. My reward is with me to give to everyone according to his works. More is written in about Jesus' second coming in the Bible than about his first coming. Just a note of interest here. Next week, we're going to talk a little bit more about why the four Gospels, the difference between them, and we'll start diving into the book of Mark. And the reason why I want to go into Mark first and look into Mark, and we're not going to do it verse by verse, but I'm going to talk about the book as a whole, is there's reasons to believe that Mark was the first Gospel written, and we'll go for the reasons why and wherefores after that. Any questions? Comments? So I'm hoping to keep this interesting and not academic. It's, uh, uh, I, I know there's a whole lot here, but I think if we have a good understanding of the books and how they were written and when and the whys and wherefores, that gives us a little better background in understanding the books. All right, let me go ahead and dismiss this in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the word that you have given us. We know that they, they're all inspired. We know that there's a reason for every word that is written. We know that it came at the right time. And Lord, we know that it was written for us. Lord, may you help us understand and build a hunger within us for your word. 
Watch over us as we go our different ways. Be with those that we mentioned in our prayer needs earlier. Lord, that those that, uh, that need you, that you bring peace, you bring comfort, you bring healing where it's needed. Watch over us, protect us, guide us, direct us, and may we glorify Jesus in all that we say and do. For we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Y'all have a great rest of the week.